Hello, everybody. So my name is Jeremy Leroy. I'm from France, so please excuse my very bad French accent. I usually talk about marketing and iOS apps, but this year I wanted to do something a bit more technical, uh, especially that there, there was already uh, some, uh, some presentations on iOS. So let's start uh, with a few quick facts about my developer journey. I started using Sojo in 2008. Uh, that is the main language I've been using since, although I have been discovering some other languages. My favorite overall is Sojo. I quit my consulting job in 2016, uh, working for a big company, and now I'm a full-time iOS developer for the past eight years. In eight years, I have released uh, 14 iOS apps and iPad apps. Uh, unfortunately, two of them got banned from the App Store, but that's a story for another time. Uh, in eight years, I got eight million downloads for a solo developer that is quite big. Uh, two of the apps, so two out of 14, uh, got less than a thousand downloads each, but that's not a big deal because the other apps are doing quite good. And the most downloaded app is now close to 3.5 million downloads and gets an additional 2,000 downloads per day. Per day. Per day. Uh, some of you might know that I have a six-year-old son and I love reading him bedtime stories, so now it's time for a little story. So once upon a time, there was a developer or a team of developers. It could be me, could be you, could be you, maybe not you. No. You. <laughs> uh, this de developer had a great idea. They would build a life-changing app. So they started working. They worked for hours, days, weeks, using all tools at their disposal, especially Sojo. As their experienced developer, uh, they made extensive use of try-catch statement statements to make sure to catch all exceptions in their code and to make sure that the code wouldn't break and the app would be functional. After setting up a team of beta testers, the app is now ready. So finally, the app is ready, published, starts getting many downloads. They have a marketing team working for them. Uh, they get a lot of users, a lot of downloads. Everything is good. The developer is very happy with the work accomplished and lived happily ever after. Maybe not. That would actually be too easy. So let's take this very, very famous quote. <laughs> Users will break your code no matter what. <laughs> there will always be a user that double clicks a button instead of single clicking it, even on an iPhone. There will always be a user that goes back and changes a value when he isn't supposed to, types a string instead of numbers, and so on. There will always be some way to break your app. No app is perfect. And this especially happens in my apps. The more downloads, the more users you get, the more problems you will find, some problems you wouldn't even imagine could, be, could happen. Unfortunately, the developer or team of developers only being human, the code isn't perfect and the app has many bugs. Some bugs are discovered by users and reported. Very few actually report them. Some others are silent exceptions and the user doesn't even notice. And just for a quick story, uh, out of all these 8 million downloads that I have, whenever I have a user report saying there's this problem in the app, most of the time the person will say, I am also a developer. So developers do report bugs, regular users don't. And there are so many apps, I mean, it could be iPhone apps, could be Mac apps, and so on, so many different apps available that whatever your app does, there is certainly another app that does the same thing and maybe better. So whenever a user finds a bug, it, the, work, the app doesn't work like they want, they just move on to the next one. This is true for consumer apps, obviously, not for big companies that would buy your, your software. So what is the next step? The next step for the team of developers is to build an exception report system. Although the developer spent several weeks on his project, he's going to spend another week or so, or even more time, building an exception report system. 
This process, of course, takes time. There are many things to think about. It could be getting the stack trace, priorities, email reports, reporting API, understanding the workflow, grouping similar issues together, unit testing, bug reports, and so on, over, over, and over. The user, well, the developer is quickly overwhelmed. So I personally went this path in the eight years of writing apps and also quickly felt overwhelmed. I wrote three different error reporting systems. The first one was far from perfect, so I moved on to a second one. Second one was okay, but had problems grouping issues together. Whenever I would mark an issue as fixed, the same issue would happen again. It wasn't grouped in the first one, so it was reported as a new issue, and it was losing time, losing productivity. Just a quick question. Who among you uh, wrote their own error report system? So I feel, I'm sure you understand that it takes some time, it is complicated, and it will never be right the first time. We can all agree about this, code breaks, code breaks, and we'll see how to fix it faster. So I'm introducing Sentry for Zojo. It is available for free on GitHub. Sentry, for those of you who don't know it, is an error report system that has many features. It will ha help you identify, debug, resolve issues, and overall it will increase your productivity. So why Sentry? Sentry is already used by major companies such as GitHub, Disney, Sonos, Cloudflare, and so on. It is trusted, it is used by big names, and I have been using, using it for the past three years. It is reliable, and I'm extremely happy with it. Let's see some of the Sentry key features. So it has error monitoring, performance monitoring, user feedback, email notifications. It is free up to 50,000 error, errors per month. So for my, in my case, it actually took me two years of using Sentry, adding it to all of my different apps to start paying for it. And now that I'm paying, it, uh, now that I'm paying for it, it's only $30 per month. And it can also be self-hosted. If you want to host it on your own uh, server, uh, I think it is completely free when you host it on a server and you just manage everything on your own and never pay for it. The recurring question I see on the forums uh, and also talking to other developers when talking about Sentry is, what can Sentry do that my own error reporting system doesn't? Well, depending on how complex your system is, maybe nothing more, but the problem of building your own system is it takes a lot of time to implement. It takes a lot of time to get it perfect. Grouping of exceptions issues can be quite difficult. Is it depending on the stack trace? Maybe the stack trace changes when you change operating system and so on. There are problems like that. What you want as a developer is better, pro better focus on productivity of your app, not better focus on managing the exceptions themselves. and Sentry is trusted and reliable. So let's see how easy it is to implement Sentry in your own project. So after downloading the code from GitHub, you open the Sentry example project. There's one, there one example for desktop, one example for web, one example for iOS, and I'm going to work on an example for Android too. Then just copy paste the Sojo Sentry module from the demo project into your own project. After that, uh, you need to do a bit of configuration, which is actually quite simple. So you create a new project on Sentry.io on their website. This will give you what they call a DSN. So DSN is just basically a URL that you copy and paste into your own project. In the app.opening event, of your app, uh, this is where you're going to configure Sentry. Just paste the DSN code, uh, create a Sentry 
uh, property somewhere in your code that could be uh, in a module or an app directly, and just call sentry controller dot get instance with the DSM. Next, we need to handle the exceptions. In the app dot unhandled exception event, you add this code. You can just basically copy paste this from the demo projects into your own. And this is enough to start catching exceptions. To submit an exception, it is one line of code. Just sentry that submit exception, the error, and current method name. For those of you who don't know what current method name is, it is an automatic constant that Sozo creates in every method and event handler giving the name and the position, basically, of where this code is executing from. Uh, and it is pretty useful to know where you are in the code. So let's see this more in detail. So when you call sentry controller submit exception, there are some um, optional parameters that can be used. So first is the exact actual exception then current method name, or if you want to change the name, it's just a string, and put whatever you want. Afterwards is a message, if you want to give more context, give more information about the exception you're reporting. You also have the error level, so it could be information, it could be debug, it could be warning, it could be cra a fatal, uh, and so on. And if you're in a web app, you can also pass the web session as a parameter that will also give you more context about the browser, uh, about everything that is available in the web session object. So let's see Sentry in action. So this is a demo project. So I have put the DSN and configured sentry in the opening event, I put the code in unhandled exception, and here in a button, I'm going to create an exception. And run. Pressing the button, obviously an exception is created. Now I'm going to go directly to Sentry, to the Sentry's dashboard. Internet is quite slow here. If, sen if the app doesn't have a connection? Um, if the app doesn't have a connection at all, never connects to the internet, you can't use Sentry, obviously. But if there's no connection at the moment, uh, se the Sentry code I wrote saves the exception on the computer, and next time the app is opened, it automatically sends the offline, what I call offline exceptions. So here, in this, this is the list of uh, exceptions uh, that I have uh, submitted in the app. You can see here this exception was 39 seconds ago. So this is basically the exception I just created. When you open an exception, this is what you're supposed to get. There, that's it. So here we have all information about the exception itself. So I'm going to go back to my presentation to show you this more in detail. So the Sentry Issues Overview. When you open an issue, this is what you get. At the top right, you have the amount of events that happened. So these are the grouped events. So each event is basically the same exception that happened at the same place. So in this case, there were 1,000 errors, and it happened to 40 different users. 
when you're seeing the list of all the exceptions in your dashboard, this is how you can prioritize which exception is the most important because it affected the most users or is happening the most amount of time. Then you have information about the user, about the Xojo version, about your operating system, about the browser if you're in a web app, and about, or about the device if you're uh, in a mobile app. Underneath, you have the tags. Some tags are automatically sent with the event. Uh, some tags are defined in your code. We're going to see afterwards how to create them. Underneath is the message that is added uh, with, the, with the exception. This can be helpful. Sometimes it isn't helpful. Uh, underneath, you have the stack trace, the full stack trace. And then on the right, you have the amount of issues. So this issue happened zero times in the last 24 hours, happened 69 times last 30 days. This graph can also show you, help you to identify which are the most important issues to fix. And let's scroll the tags. So these are all the tags associated with this issue. These tags can also really help you identify and reproduce an issue. For example, here I can see that the language, it happened mostly to Italians, but it also happened to other languages. I had a case where I had an exception that only happened in one specific language. So as I saw it only happened to a specific language, it meant that I had to test my app in that language and not just test it in English and French as I usually do. You can also uh, see the operating system. I had the case where a certain issue only happened to a new version of iOS. So I knew that I had to install this version, test my app, and, I didn't ask, and that's what helped me understand the issue. Um, yes. So what you can do is also adding context to an issue. Sentry has many ways of adding context. So context are tags, additional information, and so on. First of all, user information. In the opening event of the demo, Sentry demo projects that you can get from GitHub, this, you have this code. This is how you define a user, how you give information to Sentry about the user. It could be the user's email address. It could be the language the user is currently using. Uh, it could be the language of the operating system, uh, the user's locale information, and the user's unique ID. When you give a unique ID to each user, this helps Sentry group, well, give the, the information of how many users have seen, have experienced this exception. If you don't give uh, the user ID, it will use the IP address. Uh, but you also have the option to remove completely the IP address, uh, in which case it won't give any information about how many users. It will show zero, it will show zero users and maybe 1,000 exceptions. You don't know if it was one person with 1,000 exceptions or 1,000 people with one exception. Next is you can add global tags, you can add tags, and you can add extra key values. Global tags, uh, so the, this is basically a key. A key is usually a, stri this, a string, and the value is uh, any JSON encoded uh, value that is acceptable. Could be Boolean, string, integer, double, date, time, but not currency. Currently, Sojo doesn't support currency in JSON. Global tags are persistent throughout the lifetime of your app. If you set a global tag in the opening event, each time an event, each time an exception is sent, that global tag will be used. But when you set a tag and an extra key value, as soon as an exception is sent, tags and key values are removed from, uh, from Sentry so that the next exception doesn't reuse the same information. So let's see this directly in some code. With one line of code, you just add some extra key value. So in this Xojo code, um, <clears throat> in, my, in one of my apps, I had problem parsing strings, uh, parsing dates that were uh, made of a string. So what I did in my app at the beginning, I sent, uh, well, I 
define an extra key value, start date, and end date uh, to send this information to Sentry. Next step is create a first exception block uh, for parsing the start date, and then a second exception block uh, for parsing the second date. And as you can see here, I'm using current method name error two, current method name error three, so that this creates two different exceptions on the Sentry dashboard. Although it's in the same method, it is uh, separated because I've given different names to it. And finally, at the end, I am removing the extra key values, which will automatically be removed if there is an exception that is created. But if there is no exception, these values will be persistent until the next exception is sent. So I'm removing them. There's also the case where you have a very, let's say you have a very long and complex method. Let's say it's several hundred lines long. Here in my screenshot, I made it quite short. Uh, but I had some method that was, I think, 200 lines long. I had an exception in it. I don't know where. Could have been at the beginning, could have been at the end. I had really difficulty reproducing it. So what I started doing is adding line numbers as extra key values. And whenever I received the exception on Sentry, I just got the line number, and I knew exactly which part of the code was failing. You can also add information on loop indexes uh, to easily reproduce an issue, and then remove the extra key values, so the indexes after the loop, because you won't need, be needing them anymore if there is an exception afterwards. And finally, at the end, uh, I'm removing all extra key values because I don't need them anymore and go on to the next method where I'm be adding some more key values. There's also another type of context information you can add, and that's my favorite, it's breadcrumbs. So let's see what breadcrumbs are. Breadcrumbs are a trail of events that happen prior to an issue, a bit like logging. It is composed of a category which could be information, UI click, UI keyboard, message, navigation. It basically helps you understand what happened at that moment. And then a message, oh, sorry. And then a message, which is any value that could be relevant to helping you fix the issue. Usually it's current method name, but it could be something more. So I'm going to show a live demo of this. So, trial breadcrumbs. So first, let's say your app is opening a file, processing, and saving the file. So I'm going to open a file, process it, save it. An exception happens. Going to open Sentry. Let's hope it's faster this time. And here you see a new exception, which happened in button three. And you have the trail of events right here. So what you can see here is first the app was activated. There was a UI click, which was button four. Then navigation from window one to window two. Window two was activated. Window two, button one, button two, button three. And then the exception happened. Using this trail of events really helps understanding why something happened. Uh, in one of my iOS apps, uh, the app was getting in a state that was impossible. I tried reproducing it. It just didn't happen. I didn't understand why user was getting, why the app was getting in that state. And as I said previously, users, users will break your code. 
what was happening on the iOS app is instead of clicking once on a button, they were double clicking. When they were double clicking, it was going to two steps, well, one step further than what was expected, and some values were not, uh, well, some parameters were not created, dictionaries and so on, and that's where the app would crash. With, this, with these breadcrumbs, I could see that it was button one pressed, button one pressed happening at the exact same time, which made me understand that it was a double click. When you receive an exception from Sentry, you can also set up email notifications, which look basically like this. Uh, email notifications can be set up uh, if, for example, on each new exception, can be set up if, there are, if the same exception, exception happens maybe 10 times per hour, if the same exception affects maybe 10, year, 10 users, you have so many different ways of setting up the email notifi notifications that you can really prioritize which emails you want to receive, if it is an important bug or if it's not important and uh, take care of it later on. Also on the Sentry dashboard, as you can see here, uh, when, I, when I open my dashboard and I want to know on which exception I have to work on first, which one has the highest priority. Usually it's one that has the highest number of events, uh, events right here, and the highest number of uh, users. You can also set up performance monitoring. Performance is, will calculate how much time each function in your app, how much time it takes to execute. It's usually in the milliseconds, uh, but then you can really go down deeper and know which one is taking more time, shouldn't, and understand how to improve your app. You can also set up dashboards. So for example, this app had uh, 7,000 exceptions in the past seven days. I really need to work on this app. <laughs> uh, to be able to create your own dashboards, I think uh, that you have to go on a business plan and pay more, uh, but I don't really need the dashboard. All I need is the list of exceptions. You can also monitor releases of your apps. Uh, depending on the version number, you can know how much people are using each version, which version has the most amount of exceptions, which version doesn't, doesn't well, is more reliable. Uh, you can set up, okay, here's statistics. Uh, yes, you can also, so for each project you, cre you create, each project would be basically an app. So if you don't know on which app you have to work, because everything is supposed to be going on. Here, you can see that the app with the most amount of exceptions, so countdown, this would be what I'm going to work on this week and work on another app next week. So dashboard, email examples, all that I have shown, perfect. <coughs> So overall, since I've been using Sentry for the past three years, uh, I have an increase of productivity working basically more on my app, not working on creating an error report system, managing how the error report system has to group the exceptions and so on. And it also helps me understand, well, identify whenever a new exception happens. It could be with a change of iOS version, a new exception happens and as I have so many downloads of my apps. Uh, some people will be using uh, beta versions of iOS. So as soon as I see that there's a new problem in a beta version, then I have to install it, try my app, and be ready that my app needs to be ready with a fix for this new iOS version as soon as I have, uh, as soon as there is public release. That's all for today. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Yes. It, it is also possible, so whenever you submit an exception to Sentry, you could actually be creating an exception, like 
create an exception in code, send it to Sentry with the category being information. So if you know that something bad could happen at some time, but you're not sure something bad will happen, you create breadcrumbs, just send out an exception that you created. Okay, yeah. The user won't, for the user, everything would be working fine. And you have a trail of information of what happened before. Yeah. Well, the breadcrumb analysis is automatically activated. It's always. I have a bread, in my apps, I have a uh, breadcrumb in the app opening event activated. In each window opening, activated, resizing everywhere. I have a breadcrumb absolutely everywhere, which really helps me understanding what happened, well, what was done before the exception. Also, something that I forgot to show you is um, users can send feedback. Oh, I'm not showing the correct screen, sorry. Uh, so this is directly in the demo projects of Sentry. Um, you can ask for user feedback. The user only has to give his name, email address, or maybe not. Explain something that happened. He can add an, an attachment up to 10 megabytes, I think. And that is sent to Sentry and will be attached to the issue. So whenever, for example, you have this user maybe processing a file, the file doesn't work, he can send the file to you directly, it is sent to Sentry, and then you can get the file, process the information, understand everything that's happening and why it's happening. Yes? It depends where you live. Uh, well, actually, as I only work on iOS apps, on the App Store, you can give some sort of user privacy definition and define what your app is retrieving, what kind of information it is retrieving. Uh, from my end, even though there is this information when you tell the user that you are getting some private information like the IP address, email address, and so on, as soon as you don't get anything that is private to the user, but only the usage itself, mm -hmm. I find it acceptable, even though maybe the law yeah, yeah, yeah. won't. In my case, no, but if I were a big company, maybe I would have. Anyway, in the, in the opening, first opening of your app, you could also put yeah. Like a checkbox, do you accept yeah. anonymous data to be sent to our servers? If the user accepts, activate Sentry. Yeah. Oh, se yeah, Sentry has, I think, 30 different implementations for each different language. Ah. I released one, I, well, I wrote one in Soja Code that you can add in your projects. And it is available, I can show you. Um, that's it. There it is. So that, I think there are three different uh, code, well, three different projects that were shared on GitHub. Uh, one in 2020, one in the next year, and the latest one which is, has the most uh, different features is the one that I released after that. Yes? There is a way to do it automatically if you subclass uh, desktop, like desktop button, desktop things. You have to subclass everything, yes. Uh, I haven't found a way to do it automatically, and I don't know, I actually like taking care of this on my own to know where I place the code, uh, even though it would be nice to have it automatically, but I like to know each time I do it, and also sometimes I add more information, 
like just click of a button. I don't want just click of a button. I want click of the button with this information that comes from somewhere else, for example, with more information about the bread in the breadcrumb itself. Yes, I'm not sure that my code on GitHub is updated with that feature, but I have been using it in one of my apps where each time the app opens, it just sends a small piece of information to Sentry, and that's how I know how many users are on the la latest version. Uh, and if the app crashes, it will not send the like closing event to Sentry, and that's how Sentry knows that the app wasn't closed properly, so basically it has crashed. And there's also performance monitoring, where it's not related to exceptions, but it's related really to performance. So we'll be timing each, uh, each function in your app. It will automatically uh, calculate how much time has spent, how much time was spent in each method, and then send you, I can show you an example. Uh, I think it's in, yes, I use it in a web app. Uh, where here you can see that 95% of users loaded in less than two, two and a half seconds, and the average, uh, the average time uh, was, was something like one and a half seconds to open. I've used mon uh, performance monitoring to know where my app was slow, and eventually maybe fix pictures because they were too big or something like that. Well, that would be actually the stack trace. When there is an exception in one method, the stack trace, I can show you. Um, let's find one in. So here, there was a nil object exception which happened in table one, apply actions for row. Before that, it was internal code. But if it would be a method, then another, then another, then another, the stack trace would have all information of the name of each method that was called before the exception happened. Yes, it was yeah. right here. Oh, the stack trace is automatic. Whenever there's an exception, it automatically has the stack trace. That is the base feature of Sojo. Yes, there is, I think I have implemented that. Um, no, I, maybe not, I think it's in my personal code, not the one I released on GitHub, uh, where I can give the status of a received HTTP request, for example. And you can also set it up, I'm sure you can also set it up in a way where if you have a backend, it would send an exception if something bad happens, and there would be some. There might be some way to link both exceptions between the back end and the front end. Uh, I would have to look at the, at the docs documentation of Sentry to see how to set that up. Oh yeah, if you're yeah, that would be impossible. But if you have your own back end, like a social web app. Yes, you can also implement Sentry in that. Okay. If you have a backend written PHP, you can also add Sentry because they have, uh, I can show you, uh, let's create a new project. Basically, these are all the languages that Sentry supports. So obviously, Sojo wasn't in that list. That's why I wrote my own system to make it available. But if you're using PHP, if you're using Node or something else, you can implement Sentry and have both send information to the same project. Y yes, there are limits. I think the limit, uh, it is documented somewhere. Uh, I think the limit when sending information to Sentry is two megabytes. Uh, and also there is, 
a feature for breadcrumbs. Uh, here, there is an option, so max breadcrumbs. Whenever you add more than 100, it will remove the first, well, index zero, it will remove it from the, from the arrow. So you can add as many breadcrumbs as you want in your app. Sentry, well, Sentry code written in Sojo will automatically take care of removing the old breadcrumbs that are irrelevant to the exception that happened. Then when you need to send more data than two megabytes, or maybe it's 16, I can't remember, uh, you can add attachments. For attachments, I think the limit is one gigabyte. Other questions? Okay, thank you for listening.